bloomed, fought as a desert flower behind bobbed wire. She grew with that pain of what it all represented, from the multinational corporations uh, to, war, to war from Korea to Vietnam to Latin America to Africa to Hunter's Point and Chinatown. Awake in the River, the book from which we'll be hearing some readings today and perhaps some other poems as well, screams these memoirs, the lessons and a prophecy as only one from within the cage of the American nightmare would know. These are words from uh, George Leong, the editor of the book, and I think really give you some idea of what we're going to be hearing today. I'd like to welcome our guest, Janice Miri Kitano. Thank you. My apologies to you for being late. Um, Mrs. Uh, Coretta Scott King paid us an unexpected, well, it wasn't, you know, I mean, like today, but uh, she, uh, we found out that she was coming into town last, late last week, and so we planned a, a breakfast for her and with her, and uh, it went a little longer than anticipated. She's a wonderful woman. She's quite inspiring, but... Um, She's Southern. <laughs> and I think their pace is a little slower. Um, <clears throat> uh, and my, my function at Glide Church is as program director. Um, and I'm also president of the corporation, which puts me in charge of a lot of the fundraising and administrative stuff. So I really felt an, a need to be there. And a lot of our contributors were there. So I'm not saying that to apologize. I'm simply saying that um, that's the reason why I'm late. <laughs> I hope that uh, the way I like to engage with you is, is maybe for me to say a few things, maybe read a couple of things, and really open it up for you to um, ask questions or make comments or make criticisms or whatever. I mean, I just really enjoy much, much more our mutuality together as opposed to me talking at you. So... Um, I'm really not going to read anything from Awake in the River <laughs> because I have some poems that are going to be published in a new manuscript which will be coming out in May. Um, and you know how it is with new poems, you kind of like to feel it out with people. So I'm going to share these with you. I'm going to read first uh, Breaking Silence, which has to do with the experience of the concentration camps during World War II the camps in which over 110,000 Americans of Japanese ancestry were incarcerated unjustly, unconstitutionally, for no other reason but race. I was an infant at the time, just born, but uh, I think that the greatest effect was on the second generation, or the Niseis, my, my mother's generation. To me, um, the camps still live because of the legacy that still lives within them and also because I feel that racism, which is um, a reality today, as it was then, even though it perhaps takes different forms, has different disguises, you know, has more sophisticated, more sophisticated ways of being covered up, um, still we can see evidences of its ugly head rearing up in Cummings, Georgia, in Santa Clara County, perhaps even in Hayward and certainly in San Francisco. Um, so I'm going to read this poem about my mother, who, uh, after 40 years of silence, she never talk about the camp experience. It was an extremely painful experience for her. And whenever I'd ask her about it, uh, she would simply change the subject. So in 1981, when they had the commission hearings for uh, redress and reparations, uh, my mother testified. I didn't know it prior to the time she testified. She wrote me a letter. Um, and I opened the letter up and she had included her testimony in the letter. And I was so moved. Uh, it was like a, a real kind of resurrection. And it was a tremendous, Phyllis, come in here. Oh, okay. Um, it was a, a, it was a tremendous new step or a new plateau in my mother and my own relationship. And all these years I've been so angry at her for not talking about it, 
for not speaking out. And in my more radical, crazy days, you know, I was almost uh, condemning of her and the whole generation of Nisei for, being able, for going into the camps silently, without resisting. And I think the whole uh, testimonies that happened, the, the issue of the testimonies that happened in 81, in 1981, changed a lot of our, my generation's thinking about how the second generation and the first generation survived this experience with incredible dignity and incredible stoicism. So this is for her. Oh, we do have this on page one from the... This is from the uh, Breaking Silence yes. anthology. Mm -hmm. Breaking Silence. There are miracles that happen, she said. From the silences in the glass caves of our ears, from the crippled tongue, from the mute, wet eyelash, testimonies waiting like winter. We were told that silence was better, golden like our skin, useful like go quietly, easier like don't make waves, expedient like horse stalls in deserts. Mr. Commissioner, the U.S. Army Signal Corps confiscated our property. It was subjected to vandalism and ravage. All improvements we had made before our incarceration was stolen or destroyed. I was coerced into signing documents, giving you the authority to take, to take, to take. My mother, soft like tallow, words peeling from her like slivers of yellow flame. Her testimony, a vat of boiling water surging through the coldest, bluest vein. She had come to her land as shovel, hoe, and sickle, searing reed and rock and dead brush, labored to sinew the ground, to soften gardens pregnant with seed, awaiting each silent morning, birthing fields of flowers, mustard greens and tomatoes throbbing like the sea. And then all was hushed for announcements. Take only what you can carry. We were made to believe our faces betrayed us. Our bodies were loud with yellow, screaming flesh, needing to be silenced behind barbed wire. Mr. Commissioner, it seems we were singled out from others who were under suspicion. Our neighbors were of German and Italian descent, some of whom were not citizens. It seems we were singled out. She had worn her work like lemon leaves, shining in her sweat, driven by her dreams that honed the blade of her plow. The land she built like hope grew quietly, irises, roses, sweet peas, opening, opening. And then all was hushed for announcements. To be incarcerated for your own good. The sounds of her work bolted in barracks, silenced. Mr. Commissioner, so when you tell me I must limit testimony, when you tell me my time is up, I tell you this. Pride has kept my lips pinned by nails my rage coffined. But I exhume my past to claim this time. My youth is buried in roar. Obachan's ghost visits Amachi Gate. My niece haunts Tuli Lake. Words are better than tears, so I spill them. I kill this, the silence. There are miracles that happen, she said, and everything is made visible. We see the cracks and the fissures in our soil. We speak of suicides and intimacies, of longings lush like wet furrows, of oceans bearing us toward imagined riches, of burning humiliations and crimes by the government, of self-hate and of love that breaks through silences. We are lightning and justice. Our souls become transparent like glass revealing tears for war-dead sons, red ashes of Hiroshima, jagged wounds from barbed wire. We must recognize ourselves at last. We are a rainforest of color and noise. We hear everything. We are unafraid. Our language is beautiful.
I think I'm losing my voice. <clears throat> I have um, a lot of poems about women. This woman, um, to modify, inspired by her. I met her in Mexico when my husband uh, and I were visiting friends in Mexico. And uh, she was a big, beautiful woman. And the image I still remember of her is that she, her husband and she were working uh, at this trailer camp, and her husband was running around with the hammer and the nails, but she was carrying the lumber. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, she had a child that was chronically ill, and I believe has died since, an infant. Um, and I thought about her when I thought about all of those, uh, you know, the, the scattered reports that we get about pesticide poisoning of our farm workers. So I wrote a poem called Graciela, and her body uh, is what inspired the poem. Graciela's arms, big like hammocks, swaying mounds of work. Her eyes like moons, moving the waves of soil, breaking, bursting green leaves, iceberg lettuce. And he watched from the shade of his elm, pleased. From her body glistened wires of water across her face. Her big arms cradled the work. Her hands like a weaver threading the dirt to a rich dark rug until the sun fell behind his elm. Best damn worker I ever had. Good as a dozen wet backs, even with the kids strapped to her back, he said, pleased. From her body, she pushed a child, head swollen, veins rippling from his hairless skull. No work, no pay, she doesn't miss a day. They push him out like rabbits, he said, pleased. Into her body, she sucked the sun, the soil. Into her fingers, her pores, into her nostrils, her tongue. The white chemical dust sprayed from the crop duster into her blood that ran through her child who died writhing like a hooked worm. She did not work that day. Displeased, he docked her pay. He did not offer her child's grave to be planted in the shade of his elm. I'm going to read one more, and then I'm going to ask if you have any questions. This is uh, a poem I wrote for my daughter. He was a teenager. And, um, you know, I think it's really easy for one to create and to hold on to one's image of oneself as being open and liberal and progressive and fair-minded and just and, you know, all of those good things that we like to think about ourselves until you have a teenager. <laughs> and then she challenges everything. And... I mean, uh -huh. I don't know that anything else can reduce you to a totally irrational, <laughs> screaming mirror of the mother that you hated when you were growing up. But that is what she has managed to do for me. Um, but she's breaking tradition for my daughter. My daughter denies she is like me. Her secretive eyes avoid mine. She reveals the hatreds of womanhood already veiled behind music and smoke and telephones. I want to tell her about the empty room of myself. This room we lock ourselves in where whispers live like fungus, Gil giggles about small breasts and cellulite where we confine ourselves to jealousies, bedridden by menstruation. This waiting room 
where we feel our hands are useless, dead, speechless clamps that need hospitals and forceps and kitchens and plugs and ironing boards to make them useful. I deny I am like my mother. I remember why. She kept her room neat with silence, defiance smothered in requirements to be otonashi, nice, passion and loudness wrapped in an obi, her steps confined to ceremony, the weight of her sacrifice she carried like a fetus, guilt passed on in our bones. I want to break tradition. Unlock this room where women dress in the dark. Discover the lies my mother told me. The lies that we are small and powerless. That our possibilities must be compressed to the size of pearls displayed only as passive chokers, charms around our neck. Break tradition. I want to tell my daughter of this room of myself, filled with tears of shakuhachi, the light in my hands, poems about madness, the music of yellow guitars, sounds shaken from barbed wire and goodbyes and miracles of survival. My daughter denies she is like me. Her secretive eyes avoid mine. Veiled behind walls of smoke and music and telephones. Her pouting ruby lips, her skirts swaying to salsa, Madonna and the stones. Her thighs displayed in carnivals of color. I do not know the contents of her room. She mirrors my aging. She's breaking tradition. <laughs> Do you have any uh, questions? You, you <coughs> touched on three things there. One, tradition. One, the camp experience. And another, this whole area of silence, which comes up in so many women's poems and some women before you came today for reading some poems by other Asian American uh, women. And um, maybe you could just talk a little bit more about the, the silence of their I think women in general, but Asian women more specifically, are brought up in this society anyway, and I know in Asian society, to be um, to believe that it is what is that stupid saying? It's better to be seen than heard, or something like that. And um, you know, my my mother used to say, "Well, if you open your mouth, uh, surely." They will find something wrong with you. Uh, so it's much better to, keep, you know, to not say much at all. Um, and it's in a patriarchal culture, uh, women's place is to listen to and to not be heard. Um, I think that 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 is true for all women, though. I think women of all cultures that we are the silent, the secondary, the second sex. Um, I was having a discussion with my husband last night. I mean, I don't like to drop names, okay, but he's Cecil Williams, and he's probably the most unsilent person, at least in the Bay Area. Uh, and he has no problems with his sense of who he is and his sense of worth and his sense of um, power. And it was very strange when we were discussing this last night, um, ab about how I said, well, you're going to be giving a speech tomorrow, and you know what's that about? He said, I don't even know the topic. I'll, you know, figure it out when I get there. I mean, I prepare for a week to come to talk to you. You know what I mean? <laughs> and I'm really terrified of public speaking. I mean, that is really that is it, no matter how many times I get up to read, I'm always terrified. Um, and, I, and I think that it has to do with the questions that, you know, you raise about yourself of, am I worth hearing? Um, do I have anything to say that would be of any interest to anybody else? Uh, you, you know, we have to constantly, the process, I think, of women in this country, and especially third world women in this country, is that we're, you know, from birth to wherever we are in adulthood is a constant process 
of overcoming and breaking those, that programming that says that you don't deserve to be heard and that you know that you don't have the power to do anything about your life and that you always have to be dependent upon a man to speak for you to do something for you in order for you to get through the inst stupid institutional stuff that we you know that the barriers that we are put up before us so <clears throat> it is easier for me to be silent it is so easy for me to abdicate to this man who is my husband i mean he'll talk you know he'll he just, he gets very impatient with powerlessness. Okay, so, I mean, he kind of lifts me up like this. And I have to, and I have to do something or else I will be just swept away. I mean, not because he doesn't love me and care for me, but because he doesn't really want to coddle me. And I don't think that real people, men or women, really want to have passive powerless people around them. But that's kind of the thing that you have to overcome. And it is a very difficult thing to do. It is easier for me to be quiet in a group discussion and let him do all the talking because it's and it's also safer and it's also part I think of women feeling victimized and it's also part of us feeling comfortable with our victimization and we've got to stop feeling comfortable with our victimization and say hell no we will no longer be victimized because that silence is abdicating to that victimization and I think that even if we screw up even if we think this is a stupid obvious thing that we're saying that we just have to take the risk and start to do it um, I work with a lot of women at Glide, a lot of women who are battered, abused, who, you know, not only by men, but by systems and by poverty and by, you know, third and fourth generation programming of welfare, powerlessness, etc. And the sense of victimization is so strong. I mean, they don't believe they have the power to fight the social worker about getting what is rightfully theirs or, you know, to get medicine for their children. And so the, we need to support ourselves more as women, and as you know, class each other's in, in whatever cla cross class and cross culture and cross race, in terms of you know what is it, what kind of society do we want for ourselves? Because the person who is affected or the woman is affected in the tenderloin is no different, except for her social economic class, than the woman who's being battered and alcoholic in Contra Costa County. I mean, really the same, very, very similar elements of your sense of self-worth self and low self-esteem, to me, is what feels very bottom line for both stratas. Do you, do you know what I mean? I'm not making one better than the other. I mean, that's absolutely not what I'm doing, but I'm just saying that um, the woman who is battered by her rich doctor husband or lawyer husband is, it feels just as bad about herself <laughs> as, as the woman who is in the tenderloin who's ne who has four kids and has never been married and, has, is, and, you know, and has, is a fifth generation welfare recipient. The same emotions, the same feelings about themselves exist. And I truly identify with those feelings. Um, so I've had to, to really struggle with myself to take the next step of being louder. And we all have to take the next step of being louder. And we certainly have to support each other by hearing each other. Um, so you, aren't, aren't, you, aren't you sorry you asked? <laughs> I'm, wondering, I'm wondering how much of this means you're, you're writing and your work in the arts. I, I understand that you do work, not, you not only write yourself, but also in community arts to some extent. And, uh, well, I mean, the, the, the publishing and the editing work that I do is basically because I believe that if we wait for, for institutional racism to be eradicated in the publishing world, that we'll never see each other. We'll never see ourselves in print. So, you know, we aggressively, I mean, I feel that that's one area where we aggressi aggressively can take a stand and can, you know, compete for that money that's out there to be able to publish the books by women, third world writers, and the people who are in the minority in terms of the publishing world. We are systematically silenced by them. And that's something that we can do something about. I mean, of course we have to work on ourselves personally, but commute to me, anthologies are like platforms. Anthologies are like, um, you know, the freedom songs. You know, we've got to talk to each other, we've got to sing to each other, we've got to let each other know our stories. Because certainly they're not interested in letting us be known to each other. I mean, certainly their best interest is to keep us separated, if you're talking about institutional racism. 
You know, certainly their best interest is to keep those damn stereotypes going about Asian women and the negative stereotypes going so we can be separate and powerless and weak. Okay, you want me to shut up and read? <laughs> <clears throat> I wrote this for Imelda Marcos. You all know who she is. Oh, yes. <laughs> she uh, said, well, um, Corazon Aquino was uh, challenging her husband. Power and strength is man. Beauty, inspiration, love is woman. Women have their place in the home, in the bedroom. Real feminist one, huh? So this poem is entitled, Where is Beauty, Imelda? Where is beauty, Imelda? Your heart is dead winter. Your words like moldy cake undernourishing us. You a rancid rose, withered petals between your thighs. Where is inspiration? Your rivers have dried. The horses are thirsty. The man you prop on a throne is straw, swollen from cirrhosis. He does not remember his own lies. Your legs close tightly, clutching the refuse of your country. Children stealing rotting fruit, paper, plastic. They hunger like the weather, a beggar that rips the skin off mangoes and defiles them in the sun. Your hills are naked, taut like the people, seedless. Where is love? Decadence in the palace. You dare not open your thighs. The smell will kill the gardenias floating in your opulent gardens. The business of your bedroom, Imelda, with assassins and aging generals whose cheeks bloat with fear, whose fingers shake and drying flesh chatters in the wind, growing over darkening mountains. How will you lock your bedroom? How will you conceal bones of the murdered sprouting like trees? How how will you stop the strength of thunder gathering in the villages? How will you explain the power of rain that washes your refuse from the shouting streets? Um, and I wrote this uh, a little more redemptive poem to a, a, a friend, a, a poet, a Filipino poet, who died um, in the late 70s. He died a young man. And uh, he was a great poet. And he was a great worker for his people in the Philippines. His name is Serafim Sakia. Serafim, you would be proud. Once you said yellow was your favorite color next to brown. We remember your poems to farm workers and manongs, to the murdered and the hungry of your homeland. You sang even with the pain, the pain that took you from us, plucking at you between your eyes. Serafin, the yellow is vast, surging like fields of buttercups and jonquils, shouting, Cori, Cori, Cori. The Marcoses are gone. Ferdinand is stuttering in an empty room. Imelda speaks, and we are astounded, amused. She insists all those shoes belong to the maid. <laughs> she sings to an empty room. You would be proud. A woman leads your people. Cory is strong. She reminds us of our mothers who want to fill our stomachs. She speaks wisely to our enemies. Her smile is kind. Look, Serafin, all the yellow-clad brown people, brilliant as the day, as the hope that shines from your poems about the revolution that has come. Healthy choices. Oh, this is... Yeah, I should have read this in response to your question. 
Hold still. Keep quiet. Get a degree to learn how to talk saying nothing. Catch a good man by being demure, the one your mother chooses. Let him climb you whenever his urge amidst headaches and menstrual aches and screaming infants and when he bids quick turn over. Hold still. Make your tongue a slab of cement, a white stone etched with your name. Kill your stories with knives and knitting needles and Clorox bleach. Hide in your mysteriousness by saying nothing. Start your thoughts with iron shirts. Tie your anger with a knot in your throat. And when he comes without concern, swallow it. Hold still. Keep desire hopeless as ice and sleepless nights and painful as a pinched eyelid. Keep your fingers from the razor. Keep your longing to sever his condescension safely in your douche bag. Turn the blade against yourself. Don't twitch as your slash wrists stain your bathroom tiles. Disinfect with pine saw. Hold still. Keep quiet, keep tight your lips, keep dead your dreams, keep cold your heart, keep quiet, and he will shout praises to your perfection. I, um... I'm going to read a short prose piece. Um, you want me really to just keep reading for another 30 minutes? <laughs> uh, one of the things that uh, I'm sure all of us are concerned about is the uh, issue of nuclear proliferation. Um, and I think you know, it's, it's sometimes the whole nuclear issue seems so big. And, you know, I know we're involved in the peace movement, we're involved in the disarmament movement, we're involved in anti-intervention movements and uh, anti-military buildup, pro-human service budget movements. Um, and, and in no way am I minimizing our participation and involvement in those movements. But I guess we're... Um, the issue is most clearly and emotionally translated to me is in the single life that is affected by the, the issue, the crisis. And um, there is a woman who was a Japanese-American woman. Many, many Japanese-Americans were trapped in Japan during World War II when the bombs were dropped in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Unlike the Japanese government, that provided research health care immediately into this, into uh, uh, the devastation and the effects of nuclear of the nuclear bombing. And the American government, who dropped the bombs, have spent no money on research, uh, medical assistance, took care of none of the compensation for the American citizens who were victims of that bombing. So the Japanese Americans who moved back to, well, who came back home to America after the bombing, have suffered a myriad of problems, including uh, leukemia, cancer, um, of various organs of their body, uh, just, I mean, uh, many, many symptoms and many, many illnesses. There's a story of one woman who, this, and this is fictional, I do not presume to <coughs> understand her experience, but uh, this prose piece was inspired by a woman who, it is said, when she returned to the United States, was very, very ill and for 30 years would not touch her family. For 30 years would not, couldn't, did not experience human touch because they didn't know what was wrong with her and she was so frightened that the disease that she was experiencing was contagious. Um, and. I understand that she returned to Japan after 30 years of inhumane and callous treatment. The, the, the family spent just countless amounts of money uh, to try to find out what was wrong with her. The insurance companies, of course, instantly stopped insurance 
when they found out that she was a victim of the bombing. Uh, she was not eligible for any kind of medical assistance. So, I mean, the suffering is beyond, the, of course, the dollars and cents. But disgusted, she returned to Japan where they, were do they are providing. I mean, they have a whole Hibaksha hospital. So survivors of the A-bomb are called Hibaksha. Um, and I did receive permission to write this uh, piece from the organizers of Japanese-American Hibaksha in this country. Uh, it's entitled, When There Is Talk of War. I know I am dying soon. In and out I float like a boat lifted on the shoulders of the sea, pain cresting high like white-capped waves. How many nights I want to let my body slide over the edge into dark, undulating arms, promising nothing. Teru enters my room with a tray steaming of soup. How strange his smooth-fingered touch. My son, are you not tired of nursing this old woman? Are you not angry with the smell of death, Teru, clinging onto your youthful fingers, permeating this house full with your children? Remember me, once robust and full-chested with, full, with the juices of health. The day you were born, your father hung blue paper fish, rejoicing that you were a boy. How proud I was I had made him so happy. Your father, ah. Oh how he would look at me back then with love. And the days rippled with joy like the waves of the fields as we worked side by side. Sometimes desire would rise in me so strongly I would grasp his dirt brown hands and pull him to the watershed where he would hold me, warm me. His kisses would linger like cool breezes until the work was done. Ah, Teru, I remember him too well and my bed is cold and painful and empty. The tongue of death has licked this wasted body, gutted by memories of dead fish, falling flesh, hair floating in flame, ashes of Hiroshima. This cruel death wraps me in rasping breath, negating all else. Nothing else matters, only the reality of this pain. Those things which you feel so strongly about my son, with the idealism of your youth, like peace and justice are nothing. Where was justice that day when my visit to Hiroshima marked the beginning of my suffering, this solitary journey to my grave? Where was justice that day so long ago when innocent ones vaporized, burned, scattered in an instant blaze? Where was justice that hot day in August when death dropped like giant broken wings, sweeping all within its broken flight? A thousand suns soaked into our palms. Memory followed as endless rivers, black with bodies, soaked with weeping. Water turned to vinegar, disbelief, mercilessness. But I'm too tired for bitterness and regret. I have only this desire for it to be ended now. I must put those years of hospitals and grim-faced medical men behind me, those answerless years of wait and worry. I want to give you something before I die, my son, that is whole and fresh like the trees outside my window, not this waste of body, this moan I can't suppress, this smell of sl slow decay. I want to leave you with the memory of me lifting your child body, carrying you joyfully like a basket of plump radiant peaches from our orchard, blossoms swirling like songs, trees swaying like women in love. I am wrong, Teru. I have one regret. This throat of death sucking without comfort. For 30 years I would not touch you nor your father for fear you would catch this then unknown disease. And I would weep those endless nights with loneliness and fury because I could not cradle my grandchildren nor laugh with them on my lap nor kiss their plump faces. Yes, I regret those years empty with not touching, not knowing, those endless tests, those endless costs, my body ravaged slowly by the cancer of that bombing, they say so now. All those years, I could have been comforted by holding your face in my hands, my son. When your father died, 
I blame myself. I am so tired, Teru. I wish I could smell the trees outside or sleep without this pain. Yes, I am wrong again, my son. Forgive me, but pain makes me so selfish. Peace and justice do matter. If my wasted body speaks of nothing else, my son, remember it when there is talk again of war. Add your single voice to remind them of my grandchildren who have lived with the smell of death. When there is talk again of war, remind them of the blackened mouths of sad dead women. Remind them of the hands in flames reaching to a mute heaven. Remind them of the cemeteries, the headstones of all our friends, the water filled with dead bellied up fish, the poisoned rains. When there is talk again of war, remind them of the absent ones. Remind them of our wasted flesh. Not out of bitterness, my son, but out of compassion. Not for me, my son, but for my grandchildren. The sleep comes now like no other. Your father is on this ship that rides my waves. The distance between us lessens. He has waited as he did on the furrows of our fields, thirsting for my lips and the cool drink I have made for him. I cannot mend my past and my present, now as thin as a wing's membrane. Perhaps you can, my son. I will touch the smile that hides in the corners of your mouth this last time. I will not cry for these years that we have spent at distance. I will only hear the peach trees swaying like women in love. My body is billowing on the great shoulders of this sea, and I join your father, brilliant as a thousand suns that burn into this, my darkness. I really would like for you to do some talking. If you... Oh, ages, ages and ages. Sometimes um, they're quick, I mean like a day or two days, and I'm very suspicious of them. So, I, you, I mean, you know what I mean? It, like if it's too easy, it's kind of like, God, did I say that? I mean, there must be something wrong if it's too easy. Um, but I, it usually takes me to come from beginning to my feeling is completed, sometimes up to six months. I mean, I will rewrite and rewrite and rewrite. Yes? Your poetry and the way you read it absolutely gives me goosebumps. Thank you. Really beautiful. Thank you. And I missed some of it because when you were reading the poem to your daughter, I flashed to my own daughter, um, who's 23, who I just admire and just like her so much as well as I love her because I can hear her voice and in the reading I can hear her voice saying this is the way it is for me to someone and then I heard her father later telling me the same words that his mother had also told me that she's going to chase away the men being so outspoken like that and you can hear his voice telling her that yeah, yeah. And, and then I heard myself being quiet because, you know, thinking, I, you know, I like this about her so much. It's also very much her father's trait. And all that was going on for me, and I thought, I wonder, do you ever sit there and talk with your daughter? And I'm trying to remember if I ever talked with mine about the fact that even though I want her to be, you know, I want her to be that way, and I'm trying to be, you know, more myself and free, I don't think I've ever sat down and talked to her about I'm trying to do it, but I know sometimes I'm not doing it because so much of it is reflex, so much of the silence is reflex. Mm -hmm. Well, my daughter has just left home, and she's left home abruptly. She's 19. And it's been a very painful thing for me because I've had to look at myself and say, well, did I do that? What you're asking, mm -hmm. you know? The first thing that I think we do, all of us do, I mean, I think it's universally men and women, mothers and fathers, is where did I go wrong? What did I do, not do that I should have done, you know? I mean, I mean, it's not horrible. We're talking to each other and all that, and hopefully this will be a beginning of a new relationship between her and myself 
and hopefully now that she's out of the house, and I mean, she will experience what I've been giving a lot of lip service to, which is, you must increase your choices, you must, you know, do this, you must do this, you must be independent, you got to pay for your own car, you know, all this stuff, right? Which she feels is very oppressive for me. And now, in terms of saying to her, you know, I love you, I accept you, this is great, this is wonderful, you're strong, I mean, I, I support that strength, I mean, blah, blah, blah. you know, I mean, yes, of course, and I think all of you who are not mothers, um, can identify with the other side of that. And I'm sure when you are mothers, you can identify with us too. I mean, believe me. Um, there's, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a very, I mean, I, un, I mean universally, I, I, I can't believe I, I talked to the most together women. The women I think are so together. They are psychologists, they are like professionals, they are, you know, whatever, whatever, okay? They are mothers, they are profe I've talked to professional mothers who have 12 kids, etc. Universally, we have the same problem. We have to struggle with our kids, and we have to struggle with the fact that they are individuals, they are not ours, you know? They're not going to mirror back what we want to see. They are themselves. And boy, that's really hard to let go of, you know? I mean, when she... I, I'm married to a black man. When she was dating, you know, Mexican-Americans, I was going, oh my God. How am I going to handle this? You know, here I am trying to, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm out here lecturing about racism, okay? And I'm going, my daughter is going out with a low rider. What am I going to do about that? So, I mean, I have to deal with myself, you know, and she makes me do it. I mean, I have no choice in the matter. I absolutely have no, there is no escape with your kids. No escape. Um, don't let that get out of this room. <laughs> I hope this isn't going to be shown anywhere else. But yes, I mean, yeah. I, did I answer your question? Yeah, I, I just wanted to tell you what a connection I made with your, you know, with your poetry in, in other ways, too, but that one was lingering in the way that it just took me immediately to, you know, to sometimes it's my God. Very nice. Thank you. Oh, you're, you're such an extraordinarily strong writer. Uh, it's just really uh, powerful. Thank you. So and I wonder, when you think of yourself and all the things you do and all the things you are, whether a writer comes right at the top or whether, like many women that we've been talking about, but we feel uncomfortable saying, I'm a poet or I'm a writer. I never say I'm a poet. When people say, what do you do? I say, oh, I work at Glide. <laughs> You know, I mean, that, isn't that how we identify ourselves? Isn't that how we define ourselves in terms of the work ethic, in terms of what we do as a job, in terms of how, you know, the society defines us? You know, you don't say, oh, I'm a mother. I'm a creator. I'm a thought thinker. I'm a, you know. I mean, you don't, but you don't, you don't, I mean, I mean, people ask me, what are you? I mean, what are you? Okay, because they're, I mean, that's part of the racism thing. But one thing you're talking about is how difficult it is. For, for the reasons you were explaining earlier, uh, and with regard to, to your husband, you know, for a woman to get up and say, I am something like a writer. I am a writer. You certainly are a writer. <laughs> you know, Thank, you. Thank you. Whether it's, whether it's all published, you know, whether it's on some bestseller list or not, um, that would be lovely. And, uh, <laughs> and, and why is it so difficult for us to put ourselves out there? Men do it. Men who don't do anything. And else. no conflict about it. No, no second thought about that, right? It is just as automatically as breathing for them. For them, excuse me, gentlemen. Uh, but, I mean, for us, we have to go, oh, gee, wow, mm, I wonder if I, you know, mm. And I never say, oh, I write, I'm a poet. I never do that. Um, ex I mean, unless it's like specifically appropriate. But that's not, I mean, you know, I, I think that there are a lot of things that go on for us on that, you know. I mean, there's the presumption, for me anyway, the presumption that, dare I call myself a poet, but there's a lot, of, the, again, defining yourself in society according to the work ethic, you know, in, in terms of an, earning, an earned wage. Um, I mean, we even now, right? I mean, the whole feminist movement, the women's movement has put us in conflict about housework. I mean, being parents and being, you know, staying at home with your kid. I mean, I, I, I talk to women who feel guilty about taking care of their kids and not working. I mean, it's really, 
we are, we're, it's very complex for us. Something that, that uh, I noticed in your, um, in the poem, uh, Loving from Vietnam to Zimbabwe, and that I saw also some of the other poems, you know, you write, as with, you space the poems on the page so that there is a kind of echo going on. And it's more schizophrenic, know. actually. No, and, and I realized in, in uh, the Loving from Vietnam to Zimbabwe, it seemed as though you had two separate poems that that you then put together um, in that zigzag way. They could read separately, but they're very powerful juxta juxtaposed, as you have them there. And it's that same um, juxtaposing reality, the poem about the, about the Mexican woman, mm -hmm. uh, the voice coming in from mm -hmm. the, uh, the employer on the side. So much of the power is in that, making us see the absurdity of two very different uh, ways of looking at the world, or two very different perspectives existing at the same time. Your mother's speech and your commentary on it. You seem to, to like that kind of format. Yeah, I, it's because I'm, I think, partially because I'm so disorganized. <laughs> but, but I think it's because I do hear several voices, you know, in poetry. Um, and it's, it's a style that feels more comfortable. Someone said here, because it's dramatic, and I think you hear the drama in the, uh, in the poem as you read it. I do look for drama in the poem. I do. I mean, I think that, you know, I think the, the purpose or the, the goal for me of poetry is to somehow open the door for the reader or for the listener to experience something or, so, you know, to feel something of what it is that you know, I'm experiencing um, and hope that it's a value but if you're, and, and to touch you. Um, and if you're not touched, I mean, I think I get a lot of criti criticism, some, not a lot, but maybe they don't, just don't say it to me a lot. Yeah. But I, I do get comments that, boy, you know, your poem seems so angry. Um, you seem bitter. Uh, I hope I don't sound bitter. I know that I have a lot of anger. Um, and I, I guess I feel that uh, poems that leave me cold, you know, that are very abstract, um, I, I, don't, I can't maintain an interest in. They leave me indifferent. We have enough indifference and apathy, it seems to me. And I think that a poet's responsibility is also to help or a writer's responsibility is to help point out certain realities that should be changed. Um, and if you can touch someone, because you can't get people to do anything until they're touched, until they're moved to do so, until they want to do so. Hopefully writing does touch some part of you that would, you know, make you see another reality, or make you want to do something about that reality. I mean, that's the goal. I mean, that's what I strive for. Any uh, in the class, we focused, we read the poetry in groups of poems, uh, focusing on uh, ethnic issues as well as women's issues. And of course, all the poetry that we're reading is by women. But the question comes up over and over again, um, how important is it for, to identify a poet uh, by ethnic origin, for example. How important is it that you are Japanese-American, that you are Asian-American? Um, in terms of your poetry, many, there are those who will say, well, a poem is a poem, poetry is poetry, why do we care? What's your feeling about the importance of, of uh, the body of poetry being written by Asian-American women, for example? Oh. I, well, I cannot separate myself from my Asian Americanness, if you know what I'm saying. I mean, the experiences that have occurred for Asian Americans and for people of color in this country, I think, are quite unique in terms of the issue of racism, in terms of the issue of exclusion, in terms of the issue of slavery, camps, ghettos, isolation. I mean, you cannot separate out our raceness, our racial ethnicity, from the experiences that I think touch us most deeply. And we write about that which touches us most deeply. However, I think 
that what institutional racism does is it puts us in a little box which says that our experiences and what we talk about is not universal. Do you understand what I'm saying? So that my pain as an Asian American woman growing up believing that I was ugly because I'm not blonde and blue-eyed and I mean everything that we see on the TV and the movies, uh, I mean, you know, Asian women who fall in love with white men die. You know, you saw Sayonara, you saw, you know, all those movies where we are, we, are, we die. You know, I mean, ugh, punish them, boom, off the screen, we'll teach you. I mean, it's, it's really, um, I mean, and, and you, I mean, you, I don't know, I mean, I, it, I don't know how the rest of you women of color feel, but boy, that's real hard to overcome. It's real hard to overcome. If you don't have 33 inch hips and a 40 inch bust, boy, you can just flick it in. Um, so, and blonde, I mean, so I think that that has to be part of who we are. We cannot deny that reality. However, I don't think that my experience of feeling ugly and unacceptable is any different from any blonde, blue-eyed person's feeling of feeling unacceptable and ugly at some point in their lives. The sense of rejection and exclusion and et cetera is very universally bottom line. So for institutional racists to say that our experience is not universal because we have been carted off to a camp and been as a body of people, you know, excluded from our rights as human beings, to me is just bullcrap in terms of um, the excuse. Okay, that's the excuse to obliterate us. On the other hand, I do think that it is quite different for you to be blonde and blue-eyed and for me to be Japanese-American. And that's what makes the greatness of what body of literatures do exist and must exist and more must exist so that we can see the differences so that we can become a more compassionate society because if you don't understand what I've gone through then I don't expect you to care for me how can you care for me? So in other words you're saying put them together? I'm saying that as long as we separate, I mean I'm saying there's a double edge as long as we separate ourselves out then we'll never be considered universal, consider universal. I mean, it's much easier to have a war against a country of color because you have, because society, this society has dehumanized us to the point where we're not humans. I mean, you know, all gooks, you know, life is not important, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, we have been absolutely dehumanized. You see John Wayne movies? What is your impulse? I say, kill the Jeff. I mean, you know, you know what I mean? Because we are made so evil, we're made so inhuman, we're made so caricaturized that we're not human. We're simply okay and I think black people have experienced the same thing when blacks have had to go through all this stuff they've gone through in this South. I mean it's absolutely indescribable I went to Cummings Georgia and I mean I saw all these toothless white people in that line I mean that were harassing us and screaming at us and shouting at us and, and they had confederate flags waving they, all these toothless white and I could see the hate and I could see that they just didn't want to know me that's that's okay with me. <laughs> but, <laughs> and I bought some running shoes before I went to Cummings, Georgia, believe me. I mean, I bought some Reeboks. But I could see that they did not know me and they did not want to know me and they did not want me around to get to know me, okay? And I was the only Asian there. There were I mean, maybe two of us. But it just reconfirmed for me that the separation is what kills us. On the other hand, to not acknowledge our differences, to not acknowledge it and celebrate it, is to be liberal and it's just as much bullshit yeah. as if we were to say, oh, we're all alike, it's okay. <laughs> Except that you can't have the top management job. Now that's more bullshit to me. I really, sometimes, I mean, at least I know where these crackers who are on the side of the road, where they're coming from, I know I'm not gonna be invited to their house for dinner. <laughs> but, I mean, some of the white liberals, and we have real great ones in San Francisco, okay, because we're a very liberal city. I don't know what they're thinking, but damn it, 